The Xenoblade Chronicles 3 art book is here and contained within its pages are many answers that we've all been dying to find out about. Some of them are rather quite obvious, some are pretty surprising, and some are just straight up mind boggling. Like how the actual hell were we supposed to figure this out? So put your thinking caps on. Ideally grab a few snacks to keep yourself energized, as I'm about to break it all down for you and explain exactly what you need to know about the Ionios Mo art book. As always, if you enjoy this content and find it useful, please remember to click that subscribe button below as it helps me out a ton to bring you the best Xeno lore content on the platform. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. So let's get the massive ridiculous reveal out of the way. Fiora is lucky seven. That's all, folks. Yup, there's nothing more to say. I don't know how anyone was expected to figure this out, but Fiora is literally Lucky Seven, which makes the name a whole lot more fitting, I guess. Takahashi states, while some like Shulk and Rex appear in this world in the flesh, some people appear as an object, and that is an expression or reflection of their traits or thoughts. How can I change this world? I think this is the best way to do so. Think of it kind of like that. So Ricky might have turned into his biter, reflecting his role as the hero punt and desire to protect his friends and allies. Dromark may have become the cloud keep itself through the desire to protect his lady from harm, and Rhine probably transformed into an oblong odd origin metal shard, which you likely traded away to the Nopon Arc Sage. Yeah, that last one might actually be canon. So why would Fiora transform into Lucky Seven then? The Sword of the End. Well, Fiora is rather special when it comes to the many characters within Xenoblade 3, as she is one of the few members stated by Takahashi to possess admin privileges over Origin due to her possessing Mayneth's Monado. Zed describes the Sword of the End as Sword of the End. That which denies fate and makes its essence mercurial. You can for sure make an argument for how Fiora represents this on her own, but I feel that Mayneth in this circumstance is a far better example, as her entire role within the Xenoblade 1 universe is in effect denying the fate that Zanza lays out before them, kind of mirroring Sophia from Gnostic philosophy. Whilst technically becoming a god the same as Zanza, Mayneth wasn't interested in perpetuating her existence for eternity, and instead decided to pass on her legacy to their children children instead, represented nicely through her final moments, denying the fate that Zanza instinctively craved. And this is the reason why Fiora, still carrying a part of Maynath with her, turned into the Sword of the End, or at least the fragment that would become it. In addition to Noah wielding Fiora as Lucky Seven, however, we also now know for certain that he had access to Numa's powers as well. We already suspected as much from when this was implied through Future Redeemed, but it was never confirmed up until just now really. Within the art book, we see some concept art for the Sword of Origin, or more specifically, the blade that the Ouroboros Noa pulls out of his chest. To the side here are two different designs, one meant to be closer to Numa's true sword, and the other the Monado as displayed by both pieces of text. At this point, and considering the next point I'm about to talk about, I think it's pretty safe to say that somewhere within Noah's gauntlet lies the Numa core, or at least its essence, probably being snuck there by Riku whilst Noah was fast asleep one night. So what about Ensword and Malos? Are they still there as well? Takahashi does indeed confirm that is the case, that Logos is indeed within Ensword of the End. This still doesn't make much sense to me admittedly, as we clearly saw the Logos crystal turn into dust, but all this means is that Takahashi still has some cards close to his chest and that can only be a good thing. In fact, the exact wording he uses is, I can't answer that at this point, which almost certainly means that there will be a future opportunity to learn about this for ourselves, leaving that slither of hope that Malos may one day return. For now, however, we can continue theorizing on exactly how this might be possible, the most likely answer probably being something to do with the Radamanthus beanstalk itself, as Malos can clearly be heard speaking 
relocating to Numa after his death, which should frankly be impossible. I'd guess that the Logos' data would have been backed up somewhere, granting some possibility for his revival, or maybe even the construction of a new core, a feat that may not seem as far-fetched once we get later into the video. And if that is the case, maybe he's a similar situation to Fiora, and he himself is what became End Sword of the End. Guess we'll have to wait for Xenoblade 4 to find out for sure. Finally, finally, we get some answers about Origin, although probably not the ones you were hoping for. In Takahashi's infinite wisdom, he decided to answer and clarify the one question which most of us already knew the answer to, explaining how Origin works although admittedly in more detail. No explanation for what it's made from or how both worlds were able to construct it in the first place, just a few extra tidbit details, some clarification on whom could use Origin, and a few hints at its presence returning within a future game. His wording here, similarly to before, is awfully suspicious, saying that now isn't the time to talk about that, suggesting that Origin will also return in a future inclusion to the series. No, get off the screen! The Xenosaga fans will burn my house down if they see you. Shoo, shoo. <coughs> anyway, Origin will likely return in the future, but this time Zed won't be the one in control of it. This was the interpretation given by the translator Lugo Banda himself, as the specification of Xenoblade 3 suggested that there was more to come, and there would be no need to make this distinction. It's possible that Takahashi was just simply covering all bases, potentially specifying the beginning of Xenoblade 3 where it hadn't yet been activated as separate from the rest of the game, but paired with his other comment, that no longer seems as likely. The downside of this, however, does mean that we'll still be left in the dark for even longer regarding all of Origin's mysteries, which doesn't do us any favours. Even so, let's take a quick look at the additional context that we did receive on how Origin actually operates. Repeatedly over the course of this interview, Takahashi describes the world Origin creates as a virtual world, although he admits there's far more to it than this. So if you want the full rundown, go watch this video I made on how Origin works after this one, as it may clear up some of the key details which I'm about to talk about. Not any ordinary person could control Origin. Instead, a key was required, which is what Takahashi refers to as administrator privileges. Through the course of Xenoblade 3, we learn that both Melia and Nia each hold a key, but in in fact, in addition, Shulk, Rex, and Fiora, whom I mentioned earlier, also possesses a key themselves. This key gave them the same level of control and influence over Origin as Ontos, who is at the literal core of how Origin operates. For the most part, Alvis, the conscience of the Ontos core, would simply only need to watch over the proceedings of Origin to make sure nothing went wrong and operate it like normal, which is where Mobius comes in. Takahashi describes it as a collective will type entity, whom possessed partial administrative privileges and began to take over and manipulate Origin for its own gain. Now, Ontos, which at this part of the story could be considered as nothing more than a machine, wouldn't necessarily see anything wrong with this action, as technically this was not a malfunction within Origin, but simply a different set of commands being inputted, as after all, a computer does doesn't know who's pressing the keys on a keyboard. Zed was then born from this collective will and required one of the keys to gain full administrative privileges, allowing him to turn Ionios into his plaything, until finally Ontos had a problem and stepped in. I have an upcoming video planned in which I will take a look at this interaction in more depth, so stay tuned for that, but that's the clarification that Takahashi granted us on how Origin works. In addition to all of this, however, there is one cool detail that Takahashi did manage to slip in, and that is this. I know, it doesn't look like much on its own, but if we translate the page, it becomes a whole lot more interesting, and suggests that Origin uses nanomachine technology. How the people of Allrest and Bionis ever managed to create this is beyond me, but this does explain how Origin was able to morph like it did in the main game, and apparently how it can fix itself according to this 
this section. Now all we need is the Prima Materia theory to be confirmed true, and we might know what the hell it's made out of. That said, he also went on at length to describe Mobius in detail, and what they represent and entail. In simple terms, Takahashi wanted them to represent the ugly side of reality itself, and how our society works. Mobius is the leader of the world, and they control and decide everything, similar to how our very own people in power operate, whether it be a president or monarch or politician. That's what Mobius was meant to represent, the people at the top. Now Takahashi goes on to clarify that not every single person in these places of power are necessarily bad, but occasionally someone serving their own self-interests, possessing as he says, a desire, shows up and this is whom Takahashi wanted as the antagonist of this story. This actually differs from what he normally tends to write, as like he mentions, ordinarily his villains are designed in such a way where you can empathise with them, despite them being the bad guy. But for Mobius, he didn't want that to be the case. Instead, in this instance, the most you would intend to feel for Mobius was an understanding, getting their point of view but never agreeing with it. In actuality, by basing Mobius off of this real world example, I believe the opposite tends to occur, and the idea of Mobius as a concept becomes all the more relatable. Still, whilst as an entity they may have not been the most well explained part of the game, I do think that them themselves, along with this clarification, makes them one of the more interesting additions to a Xenoblade game yet. Well, we got confirmation. Riku is a big fat liar. Honestly, the amount of trouble this little fluffball has given us the past two years is ridiculous. And dude isn't even sorry. The entire time, the entire game, Riku was completely aware of exactly what was going on and decided to give us the most roundabout, convoluted way of explaining everything. But let's face it, we already all knew that. Aside from speaking in riddles, literally pretending to to be surprised from seeing children for the first time in a while, just to point out what the party has likely already seen, he just straight up lies about Lucky Seven. You know how Origin Metal is a mystery and the closest explanation was always Lucky Seven as it's made from the same stuff? Well, we base most of our theories off of it, being constructed out of seven metals, but all that was just a freaking lie. I mean, come on Takahashi, there's good foreshadowing and implying something's not what it seems and there's just straight up misinformation. In fact, I even mentioned in previous videos that he never straight up lies, only ever being his convoluted self. Guess I gotta go back and make some alterations there. At least Takahashi confirmed that Nopon don't age, however, making them immortal within the world of Ionia. Last thing we need is him claiming that he's only slightly older than Noah and the rest of the gang. Common variety Nopon my ass. There is a silver lining though. We can finally end the debate of who Riku's father actually is, because it was always obviously Ricky. Team Kino can go hit the bench now and come back another day. It's over, you lose. Whilst the Nopon may get to live forever, it was also confirmed that the Liberators, namely Shulk and Rex, don't, which is relatively still a mystery. See, Takahashi words it as Shulk and Rex arrive within Ionios, as if they weren't brought here with the rest of everyone one else, or came at a different time. Which should be impossible, as after the worlds were assimilated into origin, nothing existed on the outside, as can clearly be seen at the end of Future Adeem. In addition, if they had appeared from its creation like everyone else, then they would have surely aged far more, as multiple iterations of Noah had came and gone when the events of Future Redeemed takes place. So what the hell is going on? Well, there are two explanations that I can come up with. Number one, Zed revived them once Origin was taken over by Alpha. Understanding that he could not defeat him alone and requiring the additional two keys held within the both of them. This would work as Shulk and Rex do look roughly 15 years older in the main game of Future Redeemed compared to when we see them at the prologue. So in this sense, they are aging naturally, but only arrived on Ionios when Zed required their assistance. What this doesn't explain however is the presence
presence and existence of Panacea and Linka, both of which who seemingly have their memories from their lives before, meaning they weren't freed from the flame clock's control. These two make absolutely no sense for this route, and it isn't explained by being lucky either, unless their circumstances are different. Alternatively, route number two follows all of the Liberators indeed being lucky, arriving on Ionios in the flesh at the beginning, and Shulk and Rex are both using their admin powers to stop themselves from aging, up until Alpha interferes. This also explains Panacea and Linka, who could also remain at their current age due to their will, up until the point they depart this world with A to replace Alpha as the administrative program, but there is one major flaw. This would mean that Riku is the physical embodiment of Takahashi in game, and that he's just lied directly to all of our faces, pretending that Rex and Shulk aren't all that old. If you have any additional thoughts or ideas, leave them in the comments below, but these seem like the only two viable options for now. Thanks to this statement, however, we do get clarity on how Rex and Shulk were able to extend Glimmer and Nicole's lifespans, utilising their admin powers to manually alter their lifespans. He even goes as far to clarify what A meant when she stated that this is against the rules, as careless things like this could lead to potential glitches and issues, which can actually be seen through Mobius being incapable of completely freezing everything, and inevitably leading the world to its destruction anyway. Nonetheless, it's interesting to get clarification on exactly how some of the Liberators lived, and what this could mean for the future of the world. Now, onto the topic that made my channel popular in the first place, the Black Fog. Graciously, Takahashi provides us with a full breakdown and explanation as to how the Black Fog operates, mostly how the majority of us already perceived it. The Black Fog is a result of the two worlds or realities coming together, straining the universe and forming the Black Fog, which is then capable of birthing the Fog Beasts. This started roughly a year after the events of both Xenoblade 1 and 2, where the Fog King was spotted in Future Connected, being our first example of this phenomenon. What's happening in this circumstance is an entity from Ulrest, namely a Guldo, is being projected into the Xenoblade 1 world, but simultaneously the same is occurring within Ulrest, although we never see it. In addition, whilst not stated here, it's likely that some conditions do need to be met for a fog beast to appear, one of which is likely the soul of the dead. Chances are the fog king fought in future connected is in fact the same infernal Guldo fought within Xenoblade 2. As most fog beasts that appear, I'm talking actual fog beasts, not the possessed ones seen in Future Connected, appear where they were originally found within their respective gates. A clear example of this is the highest level super boss in Future Redeemed, Fog Dweller Abyssey, found in the exact same place you fought Avalanche Abyssey within Xenoblade 1, at the Three Sage Summit on Valak mountain. Admittedly, this could all just be a coincidence or a reference made for future redeemed, which is packed full of them already. Or this could be some clever storytelling into how the fog actually works. Oh, I've got one more thing to say, but heck, let's have a little fun with it. When it comes to eight month old Brian, Kiari, you are not... <laughs> Yup, Takahashi confirmed it. The Infernal Guldo is not Galea. Honestly, it never made sense to me in the first place, and I don't understand how this idea got so much traction in the first place. I've talked about it before, but did Galea just fall out of the orbital station before becoming a Guldo on the floor? At least that theory can be put to rest for now at least. Lastly, before ending this video, I want to touch on what the future of Xenoblade Chronicles has in store for us. Takahashi obviously has other plans for the future of the series, and he tends to keep making great games like this one. In fact, he apparently has already started, quoting, All of our staff members have started their next projects, and are currently working hard. Considering it has been nearly two years since Xenoblade 3 released, the team working on a new game may not surprise you, but Takahashi did use the word 
projects, as in plural, as in multiple. The team has been ramping up production and staff members over the past 10 years, so it is possible they may be at capacity to release games at a higher frequency. Although, if I was a betting man, I'd assume it's Team 1 working on the next major game, whilst Team 2 are nearly done with something else. Still, only time will tell. Thankfully, the ending and the question of what happens afterwards was not answered by Takahashi, despite people wanting to know. I understand your feelings, but knowing right now would partially defeat the point of Xenoblade 3's story and Thieves. But it's not quite the end yet. Takahashi does say, like before, that he hopes to share this at a future time, meaning that one day we will have that answer, but just not for today. For now, we can remain in the ignorant bliss that things did work out for the best, and that the hope imbued into this choice was repaid in kind. On one final topic, Takahashi also clarifies on one of his previous interviews when describing Xenoblade Chronicles 3 as a culmination of the Klaus saga. He reconfirms that this is the end of the story initiated by Klaus pressing that big red button, and in that way, this is a culmination of the series so far. But as always, Takahashi is one step ahead, and is looking towards the future for his next project, using the growth of each individual person for the future, and I can't express just how excited I am to see that happen. Thank you so much for clicking on this video and I hope you found it informative. All of the translations were done by my close friend Lugalbanda and the whole complete translation is uploaded on his site at xenomira.wordpress.com so go check it out and thank him on Discord for all of his hard work. This video wouldn't have been possible without him. Once again, if you enjoy the content that I upload on the channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button as it's free and it helps me out a ton with the YouTube algorithm. I'm planning on bringing you all more Xenoblade content in the near future, now that I have some more spare time again, so look forward to that. I thank you all for watching once more, and hope to catch you in the next one. This is JB, signing off.